all these projects, all these programs, all these hundreds of individuals, CIA operators, paramilitary operators, engineers, spies, servicemen, all of them, at almost all of them at some point in the reporting history, tell me, Annie, I did what I did so we would prevent nuclear World War III. And that's why this new book I wrote, Nuclear War, A Scenario, is so significant for me in like a timeline of my work as an author because there's this, like once I knew I was going to write that book, it was like the most obvious moment of all. It was like, but of course, all of these other books have led up to this narrative, which frightens the hell out of me. Yeah. Even reading it, you know, for the hundredth time, right? I mean, how, what was your experience reading? I it? was terrified. I was terrified reading it. I had to. I had to put it down and and go for multiple walks during the process of reading that book. And I, like I told you, I was listening to uh, Christopher Nolan's movie soundtrack while I was reading the book, and it was like watching a movie in real life. I mean, you talk about nukes in in all of your books, mm-hmm. and. The what I love about the new book is it's a it's it's a fictional scenario, but it's also a real scenario, and it's I have so many questions because it's like it's not like you just go from place to place talking about events that happened. You're talking about a potential event that could happen. You're you're playing it out a, a fictional a, a scenario that could possibly happen, which makes that book so unique and so captivating to read, and it's. And a, and a small correction is that I don't know – I wouldn't call the book fictional. I would call it right. a fact-based yes. scenario, yes. right? Because everything that is reported in the book, I take you through what will happen from nuclear launch to nuclear winter. Yes. And the shocking part, as you now know having read it, is that – this happens in seconds and minutes yes. and hours, yes. not months and years. I mean, Nuclear Winter itself, the, the part five of the book, is a longer part. But the war itself is, a se- is 74 minutes, right? Because 72 is – because what I learned from the different sources that I worked with and, – and let me just say, you know, two Secretary of Defenses – uh, the head, a former Stratcom commander, former nuclear subforce commander, uh, the former director of FEMA, the person in charge of what to do with the public after nuclear war, which you learn is not much because, as he told me, everyone will be dead. Right. So, I take the reader, and this was the shocking part because when I approached it, one wondered, how will I do this? Right. How does one keep it on point of of fact and not go into, you know, making things up? And the and the only things that are made up in the book are in italics, and that's the dialogue that, like, for example, the Secret Service right. Director or the, the special agent in charge of the president's detail for the Secret Service will say to the CAT team element because – and that also comes from my interviews with those individuals when I would say, well, like, what would you say? And in some places, I'm able to quote a secretary of defense because he says, no, Annie, this is what I would say this and will give me a verbatim line. That's when you see it's in quotes. Right. But otherwise, he says, well, this would be total chaos and, you know – this is called jamming the president when the stratcom commander is saying this and the SecDef is saying this and the joint chief of staff is saying that right? right the chairman that's what i love about it because it's not told in like a third person it's told as in like first person you're there it's mm-hmm. happening now that's what makes yes. like that's what really makes the book so gripping like it just it had me by the throat the whole time i was reading it was hard to put it down and also reporting that finding out these individual places that exist where thousands of people are rehearsing nu- what what to do in nuclear war day in, day out, and have been doing this since 1945. This is the shocking part of it, you know, learning about the aerospace data facility in Colorado that, by the way, was classified. Its, its existence was classified until 2008. 
that that's where the data comes in from the satellite that sees the hot rocket exhaust on the ICBM as it launches in less than a second. So in a fraction of a second from the time that there would be a rogue launch, in my book I use the North Korean scenario, right? Mm -hmm. A fraction of a second, the entire command and control, nuclear command and control system knows, holy shit, nuclear launch, right? And then it's just tick, 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 counting down what happens. And that should scare the hell out of everyone because you don't really think of that anymore. No, you don't. We think, oh my God, the Cold War is over. Mm-hmm. People aren't, re- you know, and then, and yet you, in Ukraine, you have situations where you have, you know, the president of Russia talking about or alluding to maybe using a tactical nuke. These are terror. You have, you know, situations where people actually even contemplate this hopefully when they read the book they realize this is sheer madness the idea of even using one nuclear weapon Mm. all the war game scenarios in the pentagon have showed us that once one is launched it's the end game yes that was (laughs) that was like probably the scariest revelation for me because I, I, you know, I don't think anybody knows that. No, I don't think anybody is a, by and large, are is aware that we have a a rule that as soon as r- missiles launch heading towards us, we have to empty our arsenal. It's use it or lose it. At least for our ICBMs. Use them or lose them. I mean, and you then, can't even believe that you, when you hear that. Mm-hmm. But yet, that is an actual nomenclature that is tossed around. Washington. Mm -hmm. Same as how about the bolt out of the blue attack? Right. Right. When you learn these different strategies, launch on warning. I mean, for all the reporting I had done previously, six books prior to, you know, you hear sort of in passing, launch, you know, launch on warning, but you don't really know what that means until you drill down on it. And then you realize that we don't actually, that the way in which the policy is set up, and again, this is explained to me point by point from sec- former Secretary of Defense William Perry, right? Point by point, we do not wait to absorb a nuclear weapon. So right. once the satellite systems tell us, whoop, a nuke is on the way, launch on warning is the policy. Yeah. And, and then they, you, 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 I didn't know this, but they launched them over the, the North Pole to go hit – if it is from North Korea, it has to go over the fly over Russia to hit North Korea. And what are the chances that we can get Putin on the line in less than six minutes to tell them, hey, we got Merv nukes coming over your continent of Siberia and Russia that are going to go for North Korea. They're not coming for you. They're going for North Korea. That is terrifying. I mean, it's so terrifying and it really is almost unbelievable. Like, okay, I mean, most people do not realize that. And even if you – when I had an initially – there's a, a brilliant scientist called Hans Christensen who keeps track of all of the nuclear weapons and reports them with his colleagues in the Bulletin of Atomic Science. Mm-hmm. You know, it's called the Nuclear Notebook. And so he keeps track of all these things. And I did the interview with Christensen and he's the one who said to me, absolutely, the nukes go over the North Pole if we're going to strike back at – North Korea, let's say, if they had, you know, attacked us. Right. And they have to overfly Russia, right? And so you think to yourself, wait, is that really plausible? And when I did my interview with former Secretary of Defense Leon Panetta, who was also a former director of the CIA mm-hmm. and was also a former White House chief of staff, okay? So he has been around in all these different positions. And he said to me, I'm paraphrasing, yes, the hole over the North Pole is a problem. You know, you just go, oh, my God, right? Like, how can this kind of existential, like, mayhem, potential apocalyptic mayhem exist Every second of every day 
of every year. And it does. And we just are kind of living with this sword of Damascus hold, hold, you know, over our heads. Yeah, yeah. Like, okay, well, and I really, I mean, the book is terrifying, but I hope that it brings to the table a discussion about all of this. Yeah. Like, you know, it's not something that is wise. And it's certainly not something, you know, when you look at the former president, you know, the whole fire and fury with, with North Korea, it's like, that just seems so reckless once you know how fundamentally perilous all of this is. Yeah, you said it great in the Pentagon's Brain book. You said every man, woman, and child has the sword of Damocles dang mm -hmm. dangling over their head by the thinnest of string strings. Yeah. And it could be cut at any moment by accident or by a miscommunication 